I, I remind you, in case you didn't know, it's it's Friday, and uh, I bring that up because I used to work for a, a nasty old curmudgeon who would say, don't ever act like you're happy on the air that it's Friday. People will think you don't want to be there. Well, I could come in Saturday and Sunday, too, and do this just as well, but you know, I do like to occasionally take a day off and do some other things, and I think that just about everybody is always happy about Friday because it's shopping day for a lot of people. You go out to dinner. The younger people, it's a, it's a, it's a night out with friends. Tomorrow night would be date night, right? Isn't that how it's supposed to work? Friday night is, is for the guys to hang out with, uh, with themselves and the women with themselves, and then you, you, you do the actual mixing on Saturday night and then the, the sorting out and all of that. But I love this day. I always have loved Fridays going back to when I was a kid in school, and that doesn't change. It's just like you used to dread going back to school on Sunday nights. doesn't happen to be in this job, though. By Sunday, I'm itching to get back. So I, I guess that counters my happiness about Friday and maybe giving you the wrong impression about all of that. Some of the things we're going to be talking about today, can I just make a quick note of this? Uh, I, God called me up on the air one day and said, I don't like it when you talk about sports. Well, you know... Real men do talk about sports. Let me just put it that way. I, I am I'm deeply saddened by the passing of Ken Stabler, former Oakland Raiders quarterback. A couple of other teams claim him as well, the Houston Oilers. The, the Raiders made a terrible trade for Dan Pastorini in exchange for Ken Stabler, and Pastorini never panned out in either Houston or in, in Oakland. And then before he wrapped up his career, Ken Stabler played briefly in, uh, in New Orleans, and I actually saw him play live one time, but he got knocked out of the game early by a big fellow by the name of Ben Williams, and, uh, and so I got to see him maybe play a couple of series. He's not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He really should be. His numbers, the, the, the argument is, well, he had more uh, interceptions than touchdown passes. Joe Namath, very similar, by the way. And they had very similar styles, very similar reputations. The thing is, Namath's winning streak was only for just a couple of brief years, where Ken Stabler was a winner for a full decade. And with one of the greatest football teams ever assembled, uh, despite the fact they were playing in the uh, the NFL in the 1970s after the merger between the two leagues, they were playing with two of the greatest teams also ever assembled with the Cowboys and Steelers, so it was difficult for the Raiders to often get over the hump during that period. Ken Stabler was 69 when he passed away, really does deserve to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know how good he was? There was a fellow by the name of Daryl LaMonica, who was the Raiders' starting quarterback. He was known as the Mad Bomber. LaMonica was one of the greatest passers of all time. Beautiful arm strength and just beautiful spirals. And yet Ken Stabler replaced LaMonica in the lineup, which I think should tell you a great deal about his, his capabilities. 809, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 66, and it's not going to be a terribly warm day today. Benito was just telling me a few minutes ago we're expecting an 80% chance of rain showers throughout the day. So, Hey, it's, it's needed. No one's going to be complaining about that. And it, it actually feels quite nice to go for a walk outside when the temperature isn't oven-like hot. Some of the other things we're going to be talking about today, Tom Munz is going to join us. In, in a sense, he's the coordinator for all of the policy decisions made by the John Birch Society in the state of Idaho. And he's got a lot on his mind. He's going to be joining us in half an hour to talk about that for a few minutes. Also, I do want to talk to you if I get a chance uh, about a couple of other issues today. Uh, maybe in the next hour, about how MTV is participating in something that has to be akin to Mao's cultural revolution in China. We'll tell you about that a little later in the program. But first, there's been a topic that has been very, very controversial in the Magic Valley over the last few months, and that is the notion that we're going to resettle hundreds and then maybe perhaps thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees in the region. And a lot of people out there are concerned about what the long-term consequences are going to be for our culture. Well, not the left. The left is all happy about it, even though they will clash the most with people who have uh, any serious Islamic values. Uh, in, in fact, you, you might find that they're very conservative when it comes to their, their mores and, and their religious faith. And so it, it's actually somewhat of an odd, odd, uh, call it, I won't call it a marriage between two cultures. But the American left, let me just put it this way. Right now, there are people out there looking at you and saying, oh, thank you very much, infidel. I will kill you last. That's, I think, what we have to remember, and yet you just keep whistling past the graveyard, you know, on the primrose path, if you will. This is a fellow who's an imam in Mafreesboro, Tennessee, which has a fairly sizable Islamic population. I want you to hear a little bit of some remarks he was giving. Uh, this comes from a website called Bare Naked Islam. 
I received it in my email last night, and I wanted to share a little bit of this man. He is, he is considered, by the way, the local media in Tennessee refers to him as a moderate Islamic cleric. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, can we borrow that phrase one more time, a little bit pregnant? He's talking about something in his faith which is called shirk. Not like shirking your duties, but it is spelled the same, S-H-I-R-K. And he's explaining a bit about what it means while he's giving what we would call a sermon to a small group. Now, I've, I've broken this up into a few chunks, but I want you to take a listen to this. He's explaining exactly what shirk is, and he's going back and forth between some... Uh, some, some apparently Arabic speaking and as well as English. This is the precise definition of shirk, to make a partner along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we realize then that obviously shirk, which is the opposite of tawheed, must by necessity and by definition be the most evil of all evils. As Jews and Christians are mushrikun in our perspective of tawheed, as we have studied we can understand how, and uh, only the Muslims are upon tawheed. And it is also the same reason or the same principle of Tawheed which is the first obligation upon every single human being that he bears witness and he testifies that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other words there's no deity worthy of worship except of course Allah and now there's a lot of arguments that some people say well that's the, the same God it, it might be but it's a vastly different, different interpretation of that God I think between the faiths when you, you come right down to it and this guy, what he has just said is that that Christians and Jews simply don't belong and that we're ignoring the teachings and therefore that means we're criminal if you get the drift. And his work, from what I can gather listening to this, is to eliminate the competition. And it is because of the same principle of Tawheed that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been commanded to do jihad. Jihad is a means and not a goal in and of itself. It is a means to establish Tawheed on the land. I have been commanded to fight the people until they testify La ilaha illallah. So in other words, he has been commanded. He has no choice. If you, if you are a follower of the Islamic faith, you are commanded to go to Jihad and fight those people who have not yet adopted your faith. And he's already singled out Christians and Jews. Remember, he's living in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which likely has a strong Southern Baptist population. Those people should be taking a close look at this as well. And then he went on to say that Jews and Christians, I guess, were the equivalent of dogs. The life and property of a mushrik holds no value in the state of jihad. Make, notice I said in the state of jihad, not at all times and places. The life and property of a mushrik becomes halal while in a state of jihad. So in other words, uh, you know, whatever they do to you is fine uh, because they are commanded to do that. That's, that's exactly what he's explaining. I have been reading about his mosque online a couple of weeks ago. There was a story of all places in Pravda on the Potomac. That is the Washington Post. And the Post was taking his side. He has a dispute actually with some of his neighbors in that Southern Baptist community. And uh, it's an uneasy truce going on right now. They're trying to, how shall we put it, get along one side with the other. But it's not going very well because, get this, he has set up shop in an old abandoned church. I want to remind you that this is coming, coming to a valley, well, let's say a valley near you. So the Christians do commit shirk. They are, they are kuffar and they are mushrikun. The mushrikun are najas. They are filthy. Najasa. They are filthy, a spiritual filthiness which can only be purified by the purity of Tawheed. Allah calls the mushrikun najis, which is a very evil thing. When Allah Himself says the mushrikun are najis, Allah is calling them najis. They are a najasa, a filthy, impure, dirty substance. So that's his, uh, his view, and I take it uh, many of his co-religionists have the same view of all of you when it, when it comes to practicing their faith. And again, if this is what they're called to, we keep saying, well, moderate. And he is, he is described in newspapers in Tennessee as being a moderate. And yet he's saying, we have no choice. But if you will not go along with us, we're going to wage war against you. First of all, we're going to take your property and oppress you. And if that doesn't work, well, we always have other methods as well. We're going to purify the planet. And if you stand in the way, well, you have to go. 
We're up to 67. It's 817. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. What is it the people who are promoting this immigration here don't get about this? I mean, what 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 is so difficult for them to understand? Because the first thing they'll say is, oh, they're not all like that. Well, I'm sure that not all Catholics or or, uh, or Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians take their faith very seriously either. In fact, I know a great many who don't. But on the other hand, even those who are serious practitioners of Christianity don't walk around talking about eliminating the competition. And what do we mean by eliminating? Killing them. And and this is the, this is the thing that I, I just do not understand. And yet, as someone pointed out to me the other day, there are a great many local businesses who are making, well, how shall we say it, decent profits because the labor that is coming in and these, uh, these waves of immigration is cheap. And these people are wor- willing to work for next to nothing. Well, of course they are because we're giving them free housing. We're giving them free education. We're giving them food stamps so they can survive. The rest of us might not be able to survive on what we earn at some of these plants in these processing plants, but these people can. And so the business people who are out there lining the politicians' pockets with campaign contributions are saying, hey, you know, this is a great idea. These are wonderful people. And again, to borrow a line from Donald Donald Trump and paraphrase him, yeah, some of them might be. And yet on the other hand, it's the concern we have to have about the rest of them. So the next time, I think it's July 20th, that there was a meeting of that board of the trustees of the College of Southern Idaho, You've got to remember these people also oversee this refugee resettlement center here in Twin Falls. I think you need to go there and make your concerns known if you already haven't done it. But the evidence is staring us in the face. And the fact of the matter is, people have to ask them a question. Does my short-term need for profit outweigh the future of this culture, the future of my children and grandchildren? Can you answer that question with a straight face? And I don't think a lot of these people could. And I think that we have to continually remind them that this is going to be potentially troublesome. And at some point, it would be nice to see someone finally stand up and do the brave thing, the heroic thing. But you know what? Among politicians, I realize that's really difficult. And you know, when you you make it to the pearly gates... And they ask you, well, then why did you sell out your country or your people or your faith? What are you going to tell them? Because I wanted to win another election? How do you think that's going to go over? 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Bill Colley with you this Friday morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Speaking of people who are here uh, and, and causing some problems in this country, more blowback on this whole situation about Donald Trump talking about crimes committed by some illegal aliens. There's a story in WorldNet Daily. We'll we'll talk about that coming up. FBI data backs up Trump claims on illegals and crime. And in fact, the Daily Signal has done some research too and reached the same conclusion. The numbers are just absolutely staggering. But yet, we're not supposed to talk about it because somewhere, somebody might have their feelings hurt. Bill Colley with you. Coming up in just a few more minutes, a little bit more conversation. As we're speaking, uh, the wife of, uh, I guess it's Pastor Abedini from uh, Boise, is on uh, Fox this morning discussing her husband's situation, where because of his religious faith, he was uh, kidnapped, captured by the, uh, the, the mad mullahs in Iran. And of course, that bloodthirsty clack would like to kill him at this point. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. You can reach this show by dialing 736-0300. Also, my email address, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. Last name spelled C-O-L-L-E-Y. 67 at 824. Just want to remind you, coming up next Wednesday on the program, we're going to be joined by uh, the folks from Tripp Family Medicine. Dr. Tripp is coming along and likely bringing along a periodontist because we're going to talk a little bit about what your teeth can tell you about your overall health. Uh, There was a joke years ago, a running joke on the old Simpsons TV series. Well, it's still there, but the older episodes when they were still good. And it was about a a, a musician named Bleeding Gums Murphy. And, of course, he ends up dying of heart, I think it's heart disease, in a hospital eventually because of that. So there's a lot a doctor can tell about your, your, your dental care and the like. They'll be here next Wednesday. If you'd like to give them a call between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, please do so. It's an opportunity to ask someone in a friendly manner some medical advice, and they may just be able to you know, point you in the right direction. Remember, that's better health, 
and that's with Tripp Family Medicine. They're located on Fillmore Street in Twin Falls across from the uh, the main post office. And remember, life's too short not to feel good. We have a telephone caller with us in this segment of the program, and you're next on Top Story. Yes, you know, uh, you know how they were on Trump so much for what he had said, and I know you said this. And then it turns out that uh, he was, in, in this case, very right with this uh, illegal in uh, San Francisco and this tragedy. And, uh, you know, you say to yourself, well, is anybody paying attention? And you say, well, maybe they are. Maybe they actually are. Maybe they do realize that this thing uh, could come crashing through their front door uh, if we don't wake up. And so you, you hope that whether or not you agree with Trump or not or like him or whatever, but at least he's brought this to the people's attention, and you hope that there's enough of us out here that actually are aware enough to give a you-know-what. And so I hope that's a good thing. And uh, one more thing quickly. Uh, that's Jesse Waters when he went in for O'Reilly Factor and, and talked to the city council or whatever the hell they call them in in uh, San Francisco, and those arrogant a-holes who couldn't even look up. Uh, you know, it, it, it just gives you a little idea. If it's truly this way, just in San Francisco, and I realize San Francisco is a unique place, can you imagine the cesspool in Washington, D.C.? It all hang up. <laughs> well, yeah, we can imagine it. It's very, very sad, isn't it? 826, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. 67 right now on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. San Francisco is run by which political party? Okay, don't answer. FBI data backs up Trump claims on illegals and crime. Largely unreported data published by the Bureau appears to back up Trump's contentions regarding illegal aliens from Mexico committing drug and violent crime offenses in the U.S. This is from a 2013 study, the last available. And according to the Bureau, criminal gangs in some regions comprised significantly of illegal aliens are wrecking havoc on the U.S., with 65 jurisdictions nationwide reporting gang-related offenses committed with firearms account for at least 95% of crime in those areas. Uh, the Bureau further documenting gangs in southwestern border regions consisting of up to 80% illegal aliens were committing a multitude of crimes, including drug-related crimes, weapons trafficking, alien smuggling, human trafficking, prostitution, extortion, phew, robbery, auto theft, assault, homicide, racketeering, and money laundering. Huh, really? Now how come they're not talking about that over at the New York Times or MSDNC? Is, is there a problem with this? And meanwhile, to top it all off, over here at the Daily Signal... They decided to do a little research, and the percentage of federal prisoners who are criminal aliens is more than a quarter, 27%. They broke that down, and of that group, 63% are Mexican, Colombian 7%, Dominican 7 Jamaican 4 Cuban 3 El Salvador 2 and then there's a handful of other smatterings. And then in state prison systems, it's almost identical when it comes to the numbers. 828, you're up next with Bill Colley on Top Story. Hey, Bill. It's, uh, these sanctuary cities are amazing. It's... Uh... When people are willing to not enforce the law, the law just because they don't like it, uh, what I, what would they do if we play or conservatives did the same thing with uh, gay marriage? You know, well, they're squawking about Texas wanting to not morning, marry people. There's a, there's a writer about, this morning about, named about, Catherine Hempel writing at the uh, I think that's her name writing at Washington Post complaining about clerks who will not perform these marriages. It's, and it's the same thing. It's nullification, it's, and no, and no matter how you look at it, it's nullification. Yeah. I mean, my, my point is, is they, they don't, they're willing to uh, not enforce the laws. Well, they have to be mad when another city wants to do the same thing, you know, in their favor. It's just, again, double standard. You know, they think that liberalism, thank you for the call, liberalism is a self-evident truth in their minds. And if you stand up against it, there must be something wrong with you. They're going to call you a racist. They're going to call you a bigot, a homophobe, you name it. And then they're going to just try and shout you down because you will not go along with their nefarious plans. 830. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Speaking of Trump, <laughs> he was on Hannity last night. Also, Rick Perry was on O'Reilly. And I was listening to Perry this morning. And a few days ago, Perry was denouncing Donald Trump. Now Perry's saying, Well, you know, uh, gee, I, I tried to do my best when Austin, uh, <laughs> you know, I strongly protested. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which way is the wind blowing now, Bill? I've got their comments if you'd like to hear them. Also coming up in about 15 minutes, Tom Munns will join us from the John Birch Society. 
You're listening to Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX 67 right now. We are expecting the temperatures uh, to start warming up again by the middle of next week. It's actually going to be, I think, uh, relatively mild over the next several days, but as we move into the middle of next week, we'll be seeing temperatures getting back up into the 90s and moving northward toward the triple digits, which means, of course, keeping your, your automobile, your business, or your home cool is always a challenge. Would you like to save on your air conditioning bill by reducing the heat that's coming through those windows? Then give Tint Lady of Idaho a call. You can save on electric bills. And, of course, they'll do free estimates. You can call and schedule an appointment, 736-8469. They're also at TintLadyIdaho.com if you're looking online. Locally owned and operated over 20 years' experience. Located at 1887 Highland Avenue East in Twin Falls. Open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday by appointment. Don't squint. Get tint. 834, Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And newsradio1310.com, our temperature ping-ponging back and forth here, up to 67, back to 66. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. That could well be that there's a rain shower in the area this morning. Donald Trump speaking last night on Sean Hannity's program about the, uh, the, the basically says, hey, I've got nothing to apologize for. Although I think that considering recent events, uh, those calls for apologies are starting to, uh, you know, th- 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 those freaks who've been saying that he needs to apologize are beginning to skulk away. If you had a do-over, would you have said there are a lot of good people that come here because they want hope and opportunity because we're a great country, but with them come? In other words, would you reverse it? Sean, what I said was when Mexico, when Mex- I'm talking about the country of Mexico, they are sending us their criminals. We're not talking about the good. The good people come, and they're great people. They're better than good people. I love the Mexican people. They have tremendous spirit. They have tremendous vibrance and life. I love them. I have so many friends. I respect the country of Mexico. The problem is the country of Mexico, the leadership is much smarter than our leadership. They are killing us in terms of jobs and economic development, and they're killing us at the border. When I say that Mexico is, I'm talking about the country of Mexico, the government of Mexico. They're sending us criminals. In other words, instead of putting them in their jails, they're sending them to us. They're sending us drug dealers and people that have lots of other problems, and they're sending them over there because they say, why should we do this? Why should we take care of the prisoners? We'll send them over. And that's what I meant. When people figure it out, everybody says, oh, that's, and it's so obvious. It, I mean, can it be any more obvious? Now, one word you could have added, my guess was government, but I'm saying when Mexico, when the country of Mexico sends, they say, why should we take care of these prisoners? We'll send them to the United States, where the United States has very stupid leaders and stupid leadership, and they have bad negotiators. They'll take care. So what do we do? We take them and we put them in prisons. <laughs> and we just mentioned in the last segment of the program, he can back that up now with all sorts of figures that have been compiled. State prisons, local county jails, as well as federal prisons. How do you like them apples, left, or apples lefty? I mean, it just, it just and, and, you know, I looked at that map the other day of sanctuary cities and, and the, the concentration of them in places like, well, Idaho didn't seem to have any as I was looking at the map, although you never know. Sun Valley probably would consider itself one. Where, where else can they find all the cheap labor to, uh, to wait on all the wealthy? Uh, but it, it didn't show anything in Idaho, but we're ringed by them to our west in Oregon, and in Washington State, which means a lot of those people who are in those sanctuary cities weren't turned over. They're being ignored. They can wander all over the Northwest with impunity. 837. Now, last week, Rick Perry was ganging up along with many other Republicans beating up on Trump because of what Trump said. And, uh, and you know, and Perry said, well, you know, I mean, when I was in Texas, we had to blah, 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 blah. Uh, Well, he was on O'Reilly's program last night, and he's backing down, I think, just a bit uh, now in light of recent events. In Texas, when Rick Perry was governor, cities of Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso publicly said they would not cooperate with the feds on some aspects of immigration law. Join us now from Austin, because that's one of the cities, is Governor Perry. So what did you do when you heard, you know, El Paso saying, look, I'm not going to do this. Austin, I'm not going to do that. What did you do? Well, we sent a clear message uh, in the 2011 uh, session of the legislature, I put it on the emergency call so that it wouldn't just be uh, overlooked and it would be clearly focused on. Uh, It passed one house, it didn't pass the other one, and we had a special session. I put it on the call for that special session. 
What does that mean, Governor? <laughs> I put it on the call. I was, I, was, I was deeply upset. Did you stop it? Well, I was deeply upset, I told you. Did you stop it, Governor? Oh, a hemina, 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 hemina. 838. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX at newsradio1310.com. Of course he didn't do it. Because there were people again who were making big bucks off of all of this. Some of them were writing him campaign contributions. He was governor in Texas for three terms before he stepped down to run for president one more time. And I do like a lot of aspects of Rick Perry. But he, he you know, right now he's beginning to sound like the proverbial political flip flopper on, on all of these matters. Also, Todd Starnes from Fox News says, it's easy to understand why Mr. Trump's message about illegals pillaging and plundering our nation is resonating. But what I can't seem to understand is why country club Republicans find it, well, they can't take the honest appraisal, and they keep calling it impolite and ill-mannered. Should he have sent it on a, on a silver platter? Ah. Hey, we've got a great guest coming up in just a few minutes. Tom Munz coordinates most of the activities, well, all the activities, for the John Birch Society here in Idaho. He'll be joining us. Uh, he's got a lot to talk about this morning. He hasn't been with us for a while. That's on the way. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. It's 67 as we are 20 minutes now away from 9 o'clock.